If you got your Bibles, let's go to part two of what we've been ministering on on 2 Kings chapter 4. I, I, I told the people, and I'm going to say it again, uh, probably every service, that preaching and teaching should never supersede thought. It should make you think. In other words, after every sermon you hear, every message, whatever, whether it be a message in tongues and an interpretation, or whether it be a, you know, people preaching out of the scripture, it should make you think. Think like God thinks. Because when you think like God thinks, you get what God has. And you don't have to wait for it. All you got to do is believe for it. God gave me the greatest statement, in my opinion, in my ministry. I didn't ask you to pay for it. I asked you to believe for it. That set me free in 1978. That's when I went into full-time ministry. And, I, and ladies and gentlemen, I, I want I'm many ministers here. I have to say this. I have never had a financial deficit. Give Jesus a hand clap for that. Not one time. That a miracle of God? Why? Because of my faith? No, I don't, I don't think I have any more faith than anybody else in this building, but I might have a little more obedience. Just might obey, you know what I'm saying? But when he told me that, you know, because he's telling me to do some multi, 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 multi million dollar things all over the world. And, he, and I said, Lord, that's a lot of money. He said, I didn't ask you to pay for it. We're talking about set you free. I ask you to believe for it. He said, if you will believe, I'll more than pay. So we, and then he gave me this in um, January of this year that I've been writing to my partners of my ministry. And I'll say it again, as I said yesterday, about 25 years ago, I preached a sermon on how not to fail in this life. And it's still relevant today because so many people fail it. And then about 20 years ago, I preached a sermon called Make No Provision for Failure. But then this year, as I was meditating before the Lord, just having some conversations, he said, Jesse, you want to come up where I'm at? I said, yes, sir. Lord, I want to go where you are. He said, failure is not an option. He said, you can take it out of your mind forever. He said, if you take it out of your mind forever in eternity in heaven, why can't you take it here? I said, you got a scripture on that? I need scripture. I don't know about you, but I need something to back me up. You know what I'm saying? Not that he's telling me something wrong. He said, yeah, his will be done where? 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 As it is where? So we ought to be living here right now the way we, were, we will be when we go into heaven. The only difference is location. According to the word of the living God. Just location. Think about that. So let's go to 2 Kings chapter Four very familiar scripture. I want to get into that. Read a few things. I didn't read the whole passage, but uh, this is part two, and then Thursday will be part three, and then Friday will be part four. I'll do something different tomorrow night when I and when I minister on the night session. But I, I want to deal with this. How many of you people no longer want to think about failure? Okay, you listen to me. I know something about that. I know something about that. I know something about how to be blessed here. I got a new book out called The Big Twelve things that I use to help me and spiritually, physically, and financially. I'm not broke, far, I'm not even cracked. <laughs> That's even better than being broke, glory to God. I am not even cracked, man, good God. And God is so good. So I want you to understand that. I mean, and you can live like that here. And you always get this, yeah, but That's the problem, you need to get your butt out of the way. And let God do what he want to do. So let's go to the scripture. I'm reading out of King James Version, the old King James. Second Kings chapter four, I want to read again. Now there cried, verse one, now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha saying, thy servant, my husband is dead. So he used to work for Elisha, the husband. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord or respected the Lord. But I want to ask you this question. Do you think he obeyed the Lord? Do you think he obeyed the ministry that God placed him on, under. Think about that for a minute. I mean, God placed that man, this woman's husband, under a, a man that had more power and more miracles than Elijah, who raised somebody from the dead when he was dead. Now think about that. Won't it, dead or alive? You can get it, but dead or alive. But notice this, he may have respected God, but did he submit to the authority that God placed him under to learn? 
The Bible says, learn of me. What, we, what we've done in theological schools is teach religion instead of teach Jesus. See that? Let's keep reading here. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondsmen. Yesterday I said, that man should not have left that woman in debt. How do I know that? The next verse. And Elisha said unto her, what shall I do for thee? Now here's a guy that can handle anything she asks. That's spiritual, physical, or financial. He didn't say, well, look, I'll send you some flowers. You know, and things are a little tough for the ministry today and <clears throat> we'll do whatever we can, but you know how that is. No, he said, what do you want? What do you want? What shall I do for thee? Tell me what you have in your house. Now he's looking for something. Because you see, you can never get something unless you give something. I told the people yesterday, get the option of failure out of your mind and out of your mouth. Because if you hook those two things together, you are sure to fail. I told you to be fearless in going to God with an open heart, with a clear conscience, and with great expectation. I expect. When Kathy goes to the mall, I expect her to buy things. <laughs> it's more than experience. It's faith. <laughs> and when my granddaughter tells me, Grandfather, let's go to the mall, I know I'm about ready to get hit. <laughs> which is okay with me because I'm El Shaddad. <laughs> I just enjoy it. I enjoy being a blessing. Yes, sir. Do you know how much God enjoys being a blessing? No, you don't. Because you would have what he already gave you if you did. All right. Thank you for that Holy Ghost grunt. All right. Because you see, we put limits. I told you that you will never impoverish God, yet people ask God for barely get by. I told you yesterday, stir it up, people, make noise. <laughs> and noise gets attention. You start making noise, I want to tell you something, you're going to get some attention. Let's keep reading here, Lord Jesus. She said, in verse 2, let me read it again. Elisha said unto her, what shall I do for thee? Tell me what you have in your house. She said, thy handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. In other words, what she thinks she has is not much. That tells me most people do not understand the power or the value of a seed. I'm going to deal with seed power on Thursday. Oh, Jesus. I'm going to show you how God with seed would populate not only the planet Earth, but Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, Venus, even little Pluto. <laughs> and he would do it with a woman. Shout, ladies, I just set you free. I'll give you a hint. You ready? Yeah. Can you handle this? Yeah. See, everybody thinks when he, he created Adam, he put him in the garden, that, uh, you know, be fruitful, always producing, multiply, always increasing, right? Replenish, use what you got, and then refill it, then subdue. If anything gets out of line, put it down. And what happened was God had in his mind for Adam and Eve to have a lot of kids. Do you know every woman in this building? How many of you are women? Lift your hand up. When you were born, you were given two million eggs. Each and every one of you. God don't waste nothing. Just a little hint. What did God have on his mind? Population. Not only of the planet, the solar system the universe. He was going to fill it and we still going to do that because we're going back to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And he's going to say, fill this universe with God kind of people. But that's Thursday. And you're the proof of it because God does not waste a thing. And no pain in the operation. That means you when you were having babies, if, if sin wouldn't, you wouldn't have pain and we wouldn't have to pay for it. Because that's pain. Think about that. And where do you think Lucifer was when he sinned? He certainly wasn't in heaven. He was on the earth. What? He said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt myself above the most high God. I will sit in the congregation of the north. He was here. Who was he ruling over? 
How come we hadn't found that class of people? Because we hadn't got to the bottom of the oceans to excavate it. You start tearing up them ocean floors, you're going to find stuff you never thought existed. But that's Thursday. <laughs> Preaching should never supersede thought. It should make you think. We should know God's plan in its fullness. Not just as he drops things to us. In his fullness. Because he, he expects us to be full of the Holy Ghost. He's not halfway. There's no duplex in your heart. Oh, you hear me. Let's keep reading. Verse three. Then he said, go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. I told you God is not looking for a full vessel. He's looking for an empty vessel. He's looking for an empty vessel that he can pour himself in. He's looking for an empty vessel where no one can get the glory when he does something so financially great that nobody can think. Say, How'd you do that? All I know, bless God, I had an empty vessel. Next thing I knew, I was in the oil business. That's why he wanted an empty vessel. Most preachers want a full vessel. I, and nothing wrong with a full vessel, but empty ones will produce a lot better. Thank you for that Holy Ghost grunt. See, that's getting up the way he is. That before you ask, he answers. Isaiah 65, 24. Let's keep reading. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons. See, there's some things some people shouldn't see. Because they have eyes of doubt. So the best thing to do is close the door. And shall pour out into all those vessels and thou shalt set aside that which is what? Which is what? Now he's not saying, well, we can do the best we can. No. He says, whatever you can get me empty, I can fill. Now this is coming from a man of God under the old covenant. How much better can you do it under the new covenant? So I want to deal, and I gave you a little synopsis of what we spoke yesterday. Let's deal with this here. Write this down. Always aim for more than enough. Always aim for more than enough. When Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, Louisiana in 2005, I'll never forget what me and Kathy did, and we had several ministers from churches there were mad, said, because, you know, the way they were talking, they was going to be totally devastation, and it was a lot of it. Don't misunderstand me. But one particular preacher told me, he said, your buildings probably won't get damaged at all because you believe that faith stuff. <laughs> I thought you... I, I wanted to say, you stupid. I wanted to say the spirit of stupid has come upon you, boy. But I thought, I know I'm going to agree with that. No, none of my buildings, none of Jesse Prince's ministry going get, to get damaged. He said, can you believe that faith stuff? <laughs> and you know what? He was right. <laughs> None of our buildings got that. Not even our trees. Amen. What did you do? We aimed for more than enough. Amen. We weren't just interested in not getting damage on our buildings. Listen, I paid for them trees. Yeah. I paid $200,000 for the grass. Not, not the smoking kind, the planting kind. <laughs> Stand up, Fritz. This is Fritz Brown. Give him a hand clap. That's Brother Fritz. He is my oldest employee. I hired him when he got saved. I mentioned when you was 18, I think it was. You can be seated. He comes up to me the other night. We're in Chicago and he's behind me. He said, hey, boss, hey, boss. He's the one that named me boss. So my whole ministry calls me boss because of Fritz. Y'all know the Fritz stories. He's looking for royalties right now. <laughs> <in Fritz stories. laughs> he comes up to me and Kathy and we sitting down eating it, you know. He said, hey boss, hey boss, I've been smoking a lot. <laughs> but he hesitated. I, I, we been smoking a lot. He said, yeah, I've been smoking some chicken and some sausage and some rib. I thought maybe y'all might want some. I said, smoking? He said, oh, no, no, I ain't talking about this. <laughs> That's another Fritz story, glory to God. <laughs> now watch this. He said they were going to be full. Always aim for more than enough. So I made up my mind 
that everything I do in life, I should have left over. Write that down. Everything you do in life, you must have left over. There should be more than enough. Not just get by. See, that's why I don't deal with need of any kind. You've heard me say this. Some people don't believe it, but that's why they struggle. I never ask God for a need. Look at me. And I never will. Why? Because he supplies how many? How many? How many? So I don't tell him what I need. I tell him what I want. Now that's greed. No, that's growth. The law is my shepherd. I shall not. Yes. See, I deal with what I want because when you get what you want, you destroy all your needs. You don't even think about need when you have what you want. See, but the church world said that's greed. No, that's growth. See, that's why people in heaven, thank you, sir. That's why people in heaven don't have any problem because they got what they want. I'm over here. See, the reason why Kathy happy all the time, she got what she want. She got me. Hey, I learned that from Mike Perky. If you don't toot your horn, no one else will toot it. <laughs> so I don't deal with need whatsoever at all. I deal with want. Your children never tell you what they need. They tell you what they want, right? Oh, excuse me. You're not God's adults. You're God's children. What makes you think you're an adult? Yeah, you may grow to the fullness of the stature of Christ, but you're still God's child. My daughter's going in, uh, well, she's going over, uh, she's going to be 46. I can't believe it. She said, Dad, you don't want to know how old you are. <laughs> she said, can you believe I'm 46? I said, yeah, I was there when you was born. <laughs> I was there. Now watch it. And you know what? I've never told her no in almost 46 years. Not one time. Kathy has many times. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not good at it. I, I'm, not, I'm not good at it. When she was a teenager, you know, people go through what they call the teenage years. You know. She said, Daddy, Mama said no. I said, Jody, I'd give it to you, but your mama don't want you to have it. <laughs> well, I just picked up what Adam said. It's that woman that gave me that. You know, I, I'm just not good at that. My granddaughter is going to be, well, she's nine and a half, and I've never told her no. Now, I'm going to shock you with this. I have been preaching. Well, let me say, I've been saved since Labor Day weekend, 1974. I preached my first message on the first week of January, 1976. I went into full-time ministry in 1978. And when I say full-time, I'm talking full-time. I'm talking about almost every day of my life preaching the gospel. You understand what I'm saying? God has never told me no. Not one time. Well, that really impressed you, didn't it? <laughs> Why? Why does he want to? If you just obey him. I'm telling you, I'm not saying that as an overstatement. I'm telling you, he never. Why? Because I made up my mind that I would obey him. Now, there's some things I did. I, I didn't do it with a good heart. I didn't want to obey him. But I knew he gonna win anyway. I knew he was bigger than me, stronger than me. And he'd say, Jesse, put a smile on your face when you're doing it. I, I don't like this. But I'm gonna do it because I love you, Lord. But I ain't got to be happy about it. <laughs> don't look at me weird, you did the same thing. When he told you to pray for that guy to cut your guts out, if you're a preacher, split your church, well, boy, I tell you what, y'all keep quiet on that one. Yeah. <laughs> now, it ain't easy to pray for people you don't like. Always aim for more than enough. What was Elisha asking her besides just the seed he wanted? He wanted trust. Trust. Years ago, maybe six, seven years ago, I was sitting with some of the biggest preachers in the country. We were all sitting there talking. And... Uh, 
it got on finances, Keith. So everybody can say, what's the biggest gift ever given to your ministry? You know, got all around that. I mean, if I name these ministers, you know them all. They have major television ministries. They he, you know, big, big ministries. Make a long story short. I just happen to be, be there and all that kind of stuff. So I'm just sitting and listening because, you know, you can talk a lot and not say nothing. And I can talk and listen at the same time. So to make a long story short, I'm just sitting there and for all of a sudden this big major preacher, you all would know him. He said, well, Jesse, what's the biggest gift? You know, some said a million dollars. Some said five million. You know, some said a hundred thousand. Some said 50,000. Some said, you know, 10,000. It's all relative, you know, according to your faith, you know, and things of that nature. So when it got to me, he looked at me, he said, you ain't said nothing. <laughs> he said, I bet you got, whoo. Lord, man, me people love you, Jesse. Everywhere I'm going, people talk about you. I said, well, thank you. That's kind. What's the biggest gift anyone's ever given you? I said, trust. They went. I said, and I will, it shouldn't, if you're ever given that, you should never break it. Because if you break it, you may never get it back. And if you get it back, it may take a long time to get it back. That's what he was asking her. Will you trust me? Now to trust, you got to go do something. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25. Psalms, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25, I believe it is. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, verse 25, the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved or actually shall be set on high. Write this down. Trust will always give rise to words and actions. If you find someone that trusts you, they got words for you and actions for you. They will do whatever it takes to make you happy. When you trust, when you lose trust in any kind, if you lose trust in a marriage, it's over. It is over. Because accusation comes constantly. If you're two minutes late, where you been? What you do it? Let me say it again. Trust will always give rise to words and actions. You see, ladies and gentlemen, write this down. The world needs people who believe. The world needs people who believe. Believe what? Believe what God says. Now, I, I, can I get a little political here for just a second? You know, the world, I mean, this, this country is going slap crazy right now. You know, you got half of it believing this, half of it believing that. And I've seen some things in my lifetime I thought I never would see, you know, in the United States of America. And you know, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, or independent or whatever, it doesn't really make any difference. I'll, I never have voted the party. I've always voted the person. Now, I belong to a party. Don't misunderstand me. But I'm just saying this. I've always voted the person. Because even though this, the Republican Party got some things on the platform I don't like. The Democrats got some things on the platform I don't like. The Independent Party, the Liber, Lib, 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 Libertarian Party, all of them have different things on the platform I don't particularly care for, but I look at the person. Now, now, now you know, I, I, I've been known as a good businessman. I am. Listen to me. I serve a Jewish God. He don't pay retail, retail and neither does Jesse. You do what you got to do. I got a little Italian mixed up with it, but you do what you got to do. Now, let me just help people here. And I'm not trying to put glory to President Trump or, and down on Hillary Clinton. Did you pray for Hillary today? You know, she's been in the woods a lot. Maybe she meet Jesus. <laughs> Lost a few of you right there. See that? <laughs> you got to pray for people you don't like. Well, let me go over here because they ain't listening to the word I'm saying here. Okay. But let me just give you some common sense. Let's forget about, let, I don't mean this in a, in, in a wrong sense. Let's, let's not get spiritual. Let's just get smart. Let's just get, watch. since President Trump has been elected to be the president of the United States, little over four trillion, that's with a T, four trillion dollars have been added to Wall Street. Anybody got any business on Wall Street? I got business on Wall Street. Okay. Four trillion. All right. Now, if these crazy Congress people can get their act together and pass this tax legislation, <laughs> you see, just shut down, j j just on the business thing. They want, you know, the, the business tax, take it to 15%. They could probably do 20, 25. Now, they, if they did it with Ireland, they'd take it to 12%. We have the highest business tax. Ladies and gentlemen, there's $5 trillion in offshore accounts waiting 
five trillion. So you had five trillion to four trillion, now you got nine trillion. What's trillion? If they do this, because these companies will not pay tax on that. That's why that money's on offshore accounts, you understand? But if they pass this and get rid of the business tax, the death tax, bless God and Lord, I'm going to tell you something, trillions of dollars is coming into America. And that it, Wall Street's going to become Main Street. You don't live on Wall Street. You live on Main Street. I'm Jesse Duplantis and I approve this message. <laughs> Listen to me. What are you saying? Show me the money. Let God use who you may not like to get you out of debt, to get you blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed going in, and blessed going out. Because they ain't going to pay tax on that. But my God, you knock down that, that, that rate. Ooh, Jesus. Because Americans buy things. How many of y'all bought something already at the Believers Convention? See? Not just common sense. That's right. Well, we worried about the, the deficit. My God. They're talking about if you did 4%, 5% uh, growth. Huh. You, could do, you cut that thing to 12%. I'm telling you, the whole world going to become Americans. Yeah. <laughs> Listen to me. There ain't a shortage of money. Right. It's just in the wrong, aim, wrong, wrong, wrong hands. I'm asking you, trust me. Do you see? I said, Lord, how come people can't see that? This, I mean, these people are Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Duke graduates. They can't see that. They're blind. My Lord. Ain't a, ain't a problem making money. It's keeping it. And even God told Adam that in the garden. He told, he told him to dress the garden, keep it. Which means... If you don't keep it, you can lose it. Are oh, you hearing what I'm saying? So trust will always give word, rise to words and actions. So the world needs people who believe. Now, I don't care. I don't care if someone would have won, the, if she would have won the presidency. I'm talking about uh, Hillary. That's, I mean, the president is the president, no matter what. That's not the issue. But you see, what you got to understand, that we the people. The government is you. See, so a lot of people think the government is somebody over there. No, the government is us. One time I had a, quote, certain uh, government agency trying to tell me what they're doing. I went, back off. Yeah. I said, I don't work for you. You work for me. Yeah. Now, do you understand that? Now, I, I didn't like it, but I, I could feel the Tabasco sauce coming up my legs. Because <laughs> the government don't like the word no. Right. Woo, that shakes the government up. Now, I'm not talking going out to causing a revolution, but sometimes you need one. We need a revolution in the church. And not against each other, against the devil. We got to get the devil's seat out the church. But the book of Revelation says that you got a seat in one of them churches. Who invited him? Mm -hmm. Now, you see, I, what I'm talking about is not people say, oh, that's just crazy. No. No, it's not daydreaming. Let me write this down. Daydreams are idle thoughts. They are a form of escape. Oh, yeah, it's kind of fantasy. Daydreams are, an, are idle thoughts. They are a form of escape. What God has given you is determined thoughts. What are they? Determined thoughts have purpose. That means anchorage in the times of battle. And direction. That means you know where you're going, you know what you're going to do, do when you get there. They are thoughts with intent. In other words, they're full of things. Let me say it again. Daydreams are idle thoughts. They are a form of escape. But determined thoughts have purpose. And then they have direction. They are thoughts with intent. They take you places. They take you where you want to go. That's what Elisha's telling this woman. Not only am I going to get you out of debt, but I'm going to give you a retirement plan that you never have to worry about, including your family. You got to understand about God. He never just meets a need. He's always more than enough. He takes care of her, stops the sale of the sons of the slavery, and then gives them a retirement plan and her. Their whole life. That's the God we serve. But you're not going to do that with daydreaming. Because those are idle thoughts. They are a form of escape. 
It's nice to see superheroes, but you ain't super just because you saw them. <laughs> I wanted to be Superman when I was a kid. Oh, Mighty Mouse, here I come to save the day. You know, I used to love Mighty Mouse. I asked him, how did he get mighty? He said he broke into a supermarket. <laughs> Ate some superfood. And I literally thought about seven years old, I am Superman, tied a towel around my neck, got on the roof of the house and fell. <laughs> In my mind, I thought I could fly, like to kill myself. See, with daydreams or idle thoughts. <laughs> but determined thoughts have purpose and direction. They are thoughts with intent. God, I like that. They take you places. See, wandering around in daydreams never lets you believe what it takes so you can change what it takes to start doing what it takes. Let me say it again, write it down. Wandering around in daydreams never lets you believe what it takes so you can change what it takes to start doing what it takes. That's what he's trying to tell that lady. He's telling that your destiny is not for, firm. None of our destiny is firm, ladies and gentlemen. It's according to your faith to make things happen in life. Just because God said something, it won't work for you because he said it. You got to say it with him. If two of you agree. Two. How many of you believe in for something? Look at me. I be you two. I be you two. You ain't got to look for nobody else. I be your two. And I've said this so many times. Just think if all the church became twos. Just think if all your churches went around saying, what you believing for? Well, I'm believing it. I'll be you too. Okay. And you get all, everybody being twos. You'd be a bunch of two twos, but you are two, buddy. <laughs> now things start happening because destiny is not firm. Write this down. Des your destiny is not firm. Your free will has been given to you to make choices. And destiny happens one day at a time. Remember that old song? One day at a time, sweet Jesus. That's how Texans sing it, you know. <laughs> Your destiny is not firm. Your free will has been given you to make choices. Destiny happens one day at a time. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is who he's trying to tell this woman. Give me some empty vessels. Barring out a few. Failure is not an option. I'm here, and if I'm here, God's here. Some of you preachers need to start saying stuff like that. It sounds arrogant and cocky, but it is. It's the truth. You walk into a bad situation, say, don't worry about it. God's here, and I'm here. Uh, two of us. That's right. That's right. Now let's go to work on this thing. That's right. so you see, what I can't stand that happens in a lot of building programs, that people get excited because they want to build something wonderful. And that's great, because God's in the buildings. In fact, we go on to church. The technology has not been given to you to stop going to church. I know you can watch it at home. But when you get to heaven, you're going to get out your mansion. And you're going to the tabernacle and we're all going to fit. See, destiny is not, God is in the building. But some of these guys, they start building buildings and they get everybody excited. About them and people are giving. Okay, you heard me say this before. People are giving, my God, and the church people are giving, and, and people, I mean, it's just wonderful. Then, because they did not count the cost to build that tower, they didn't use business with their anointing. Write this down business must be mixed with your anointing. Because I don't care who you are, you're heading for bankruptcy if you don't understand how to work business with your anointing. You want me to prove that? Jesus said, pick up the fragments that we have no loss. My God, he's so anointed, he fed 5,000 people. They were so happy about their manifestation, they were throwing the best away. There was 12 baskets. He said, let's do some business here. There's 12 baskets here. Do you see that? You have to mix those two so that your destiny can become firm because you're living in a world that needs changing. So this is what God said, the world needs people who believe. So when you see what, that, what I'm saying here, all of a sudden he said, girl, if you'll do this, I will honor you. Well, what happens to some of these guys, they didn't count the cost of the tower. Then they start looking at the economy. That's number two mistake. Because the economy ain't got nothing to do with what God's called you to do. 
He's the supplier, not Exxon, not the oil industry, not technology. All of a sudden, the people that have been giving and giving, I, I, I know some of you have experienced that, been giving and giving, and, and you work in a foreign ministry, they have to lay you off. Now, how can that be? When you got up there and said, God will bless you in the city, bless you in the field, bless you going in, bless you going out. Here you are, and you might be a youth leader, you may, and you just love working for the church. And love, all of a sudden, listen, we're going to have to lay you off because, you know, we've got to finish this building. Yeah, but, 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 but I gave the building. You see, that causes confusion and misunderstanding. That should never happen. Because that person did not mix business with their anointing. And then you know what? The person that gave, the expecting, is the one that suffered. When that shouldn't be neither. Kathy tells me this all the time. Y'all, you got so many plans. You got plan A, B, C, D, all the way to Z. Because if one ain't working, I got another one. You heard me say this about maybe 15 years ago. I was believing God for, boy, $50,000. And $50,000 is still a lot of money. But back then, $50,000, Carolyn was... Five million bucks. And I was, I, I was starting, uh, uh, do, where was it, Cox Cable. I was doing television stuff and, and I needed $50,000 to do this special. So I went to the Lord. I didn't know nobody who could give $50,000. And I wouldn't have the guts to ask him for it anyway. Had nothing to do with pride. I thought, well, I'm a generation that works. I'll do whatever it takes, you know. See, Here's something else you've got to be very careful of. Don't try to meet your needs. That's not your job. See, I, I quit meeting my needs years and years and years and years ago. That is a big problem in the body of Christ, trying to meet the needs. That's not your job. That's God's job. Your job is to tell him what you want. Anyway, so I went to the Lord. I said, Jesus, listen to me. I know. I need $50,000. He says this. Okay. I thought, he ain't heard what I said. <laughs> he, think, he think I said $5. Because that's just too easy. I said, Jesus, Jesus, come here. <laughs> Jesus, I need $50,000. He said, okay. He ain't heard a word. Does he, does he, does he know what $50,000 is? <laughs> See, that's intellect. That's range and research. That's induction and reason, which doesn't work with spiritual God. Finally, I said, Jesus. He said, ah, what? I said, I need $50,000. He said, I told you okay twice. That don't bother you? He said, no, old Robert just asked me for five million. <laughs> I said, he did. He said, yeah. I said, what'd you say to him? He said, I said, okay. Then I got mad, Keith. You mean to tell me you're going to give old Robert five million dollars and all you're going to give me is a lousy $50,000. <laughs> he said, you don't have a five million dollar plan. Turn on the hard light. <laughs> now when I go to God, I got a $5 million plan. I got a $100 million plan. I got a $6 billion plan. I ain't going to be caught without a plan. See, without a plan, you don't know where your destiny is. This is what Elisha is telling this woman. You get me some empty vessels. I'll deal with closing the door on the last session. That's very important. And I'm going to make these babies full. See, write this down. You must aim to be what God has made you. And what has he made you? The head and not the tail. Above and not beneath. You know why you don't like being poor? Poor, we call that poor in New Orleans. Or poor. Or why you don't like to be on the bottom? Because you never were created to be on the bottom. You're a species that was created on the God class. Oh, now we're going to get some ugly letters here on this. The God class. He said, what is man that art mindful of him? The son of man that thou visited him. Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Now, that's, that's people without any uh, courage. They said, we can't say what God said. The original says, 
Well, he said, what's man that mindful of the son of man that visit him that has made him a little lower than God? No, you're not God Almighty. No, that's not the issue. But you got liquid God flowing in you. When we get to heaven, I love this new body. I've been studying it. You see, because I, I, I want the, I like to just have the body I had when I was young. I'd have married myself. <laughs> Y'all think I'm kidding you. I had a one fine body, son. I had a six pack. I got a keg and a half on this side. But, but I had, oh, I had a six pack. You couldn't grab my skin. Kathy could care less about it. I said, do you realize what it takes to get this? No. <laughs> Let's go get some ice cream. <laughs> I said, well, you can go eat the ice cream. And I would go and I would, I would drink raw eggs. Remember that, Kathy? Kathy would go, huh. Why? Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> she told me the other day, but laying in bed, she said, Jesse, you look good. I said to myself, she ain't got her glasses on. <laughs> I took a shower this morning, my belly button so deep, I leaned over, water fell out my belly. Just drove me nuts. I used to have a round belly button. Now that sucker's like, yeah. It's flat. Don't laugh, you got it too. I saw some of you ladies saying, hey, and your arm was just a flopping in the boot. <laughs> Don't you get on me, I can get on you now. <laughs> well, if God made me the head and the tail, then I need to get off. I'm not a bottom feeder. I'm not a bottom feeder. You go to the darkest depths of all the oceans in the world, you'll find fish with no eyes. There's no light. God didn't make you a bottom feeder. I preached a sermon called Living Off the Top. You ought to get that thing. I'm telling you, son, God made you to see the daylight. Mm -hmm. So you must aim. Let's go to Deuteronomy 28, verse 13. Let's just read it here. Y'all enjoying this? Part de. Deuteronomy 28. Verse 13, and the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. Thou shalt be above only and thou shalt not be beneath. If, oh, that word, if thou hearken unto the commandments, not the suggestions, the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. People say, well, now he was talking to Israel. Go with me to Genesis chapter 12. See, a lot of people say, I can't teach you. I can bring you to 100 scriptures. That, that don't mean nothing. Do you understand every one of them? That's, the, that's what you need to know. Well, he's talking to Israel. Well, Lord, Gen Genesis 12, verse 1, Now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred. Isn't that a great statement? <laughs> Wouldn't you love God to tell you to get away from your family? But anyway, <laughs> that's all I'm going to say about that. Let me read it again. <laughs> Look at y'all. Y'all said, please, Jesus, give me a word. No, no. Okay. Now the Lord said unto Ab Abram, get thee out of thy country from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Uh-oh, show thee. You mean you don't know where you're going? No. How be it when the spirit of truth is coming? He's going to guide you in all truth. What are you worried about? All truth. He guides you. The, either this stuff works or it doesn't. I like the next statement. I will make of thee a great nation. Now that is success, going somewhere to succeed. I will bless thee. Now I will empower you to do even greater. And I'm going to make your name great. Now, famous comes with it. And you're going to be a blessing, which means you're going to be a giver, a sower of seed, and a reaper of harvest. I like verse 3. And I will bless them that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee. Stop for a minute. Let me read it. Let me finish it. And in you or in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Ladies and gentlemen, are we the seed of Abraham? Then 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 kicks in in the new covenant, whether you believe in grace or not, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. You understand what I'm saying? I'm the seed of Abraham. Now, what should I have if I'm the seed of Abraham? I inherit what Abraham has. Ah, let's find out what he's got. Genesis 13, verse 1. Abraham went up of Egypt, he and his wife, and all they had and lot with him into the south. Now that's a mistake. Why? Leave your kindred. Lot's his nephew. Yeah, but I like him. I don't care. 
You got to do what God says. So that's obedience. Now, verse two is what Abraham has. And Abraham was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. Look at me. What good did it do you to know how rich Abraham was? God is trying to tell you to mix business and the anointing right here. I mean, what homiletical, hermeneutical, philosophical, theological revolution that caused a, a, a revelation did you get knowing just how much Abraham has, cattle, silver, and gold? God's trying to tell you what belongs to you, so why does the devil have your cattle, your silver, and your gold? You're an heir with the Father and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. That's why he put that in there. All scriptures given by inspiration of God and it's yes. profitable. So I know what's mine. Since I know what's mine, then I can go get what's mine. <laughs> now that's making my destiny firm. Now, failure not an option. So write this now. That makes you the head and not the tail now. Right? Above and not beneath. If, if you obey my commandments, not suggestions. He's not asking your opinion. Like I said yesterday, you got to get rid of your own opinions. Here's a good de definition. Opinions are transitory forms of thought floating on the ocean of life. <laughs> they change with every wave. That sounds smart, huh? I read that in a dictionary. <laughs> I like that. I read the dictionary. I read encyclopedias. I am a man that loves information. I have the Torah. My, do, do I have, Fritz, do I have one of the best libraries anybody's ever seen? Fritz told me, they said, boss, if you die, I don't think I'm going to die of something, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you'd like to give your uh, library to me, it would be greatly appreciated. <laughs> Whoever gets that library, oh, it's, it's phenomenal. I got everything you can think of in there. I like information. I want to know why women do what they do. <laughs> so I found out men, and after, when Kathy hit menopause, I had to read some books. Because menopause means men. Pause. <laughs> now, I got to understand that. <laughs> Look at Carolyn Seville. That, that beat your brain up. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you don't have to have an argument if you know why, if she's kind of upset. It's called hormones. And vice versa, I guess. Both ways. You know what I'm saying? Well, that's called life. It's all part of it. See, so I want to know some things. Because God's not a waster. And why are you having hot flashes anyway? What's the reason for that? Well, I know why a hurricane, it's dispensing heat. So, are you a hurricane that you got to dispense heat? <laughs> no. No, right? All a hurricane is is a heat displacement. A dispensing machine, just taking the heat off of there. It's one of the most amazing things. It's taking the heat off the ocean. Watch this. It's sucking up salt water, changing it, and raining fresh water. Now, how does that happen? That's amazing, isn't it? Even something that's destructive. Let me, here's a little hint. They were not made to be destructive. They were made to bring water and to water the earth, but not in destructive forms. Satan got involved and they turned this thing around. And then <laughs> they started naming, back, way back when, all hurricanes were named by name, women's names. <laughs> I didn't do that. <laughs> but that's true. Finally, somebody said, you know, that ain't right. So now we got Hurricane Claude. <laughs> and you know, nobody worried about Hurricane Claude, but Katrina. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I want to be the head, not the tail. <laughs> Above and not beneath. So now, let me look at the camera here. Put that close. Why are you mad at me? Because I'm blessed. Let me help you something. You better take your tongue off of me. You know why? Because God said, because I'm the seed of Abraham. Come a little closer to me. I'm going to bless those that bless you. And I'm going to curse those that curse you. You better not mess with me. You're going to get cussed. You're going to get cursed. See, that's that other part. That's right. That's that other part. 
you better get your tongue off the body of Christ. Because you're going to get cursed. That's a fact. God said, let me tell you something. I get angry when people speak evil of you. And you know what it's over? Jealousy and envy over a house or a car or a diamond. Uh, I don't know. Whatever you think wealth is. Well, you ought to be glad you know somebody got a house. You ought to be glad if you know somebody has an airplane. Keith Moore and them got a beautiful aircraft. I haven't actually physically seen it yet, but uh, Phyllis, we love Phyllis because she's a, she, Keith married a kids and girl. Man got some wisdom. She, she, was, uh, took, <laughs> she was born in New Orleans in Hotel Du. Uh, uh, Keith, uh, uh, anyway, she sends pictures of your beautiful plant. Me and Kathy just had tears in our eyes. I said, oh God, isn't that so wonderful? If anybody deserves it, he does. Preaching the gospel all over. My Lord Jesus. Going here, going there. I love that. I mean, and what's amazing about Keith and Vic, we like the same colors. Boy, and I saw that new paint scheme. I said, man, I, I didn't say, he stole my colors. <laughs> stupid. That's so stupid. <laughs> oh, his plane is bigger than mine. Great. Great. What a blessing when Brother Copeland got the citation 10. Oh, I said, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. <laughs> and then the unbelievable. Let's go to Gulf Stream 5. Believe in God. Oh, Jesus. And if you notice something about God to all the KCM staff, not only is he doing the Gulf Stream 5 at the same time, he's doing the infrastructure at the same time. See, we tend to kind of do one thing at a time. God said, I'll do it all at one time if you'll believe me. I'll do it all together. Every bit of a lock, stock, and barrel. So let me get to this point. A mindset stuck, a mindset stuck on lack can't produce an abundance of anything. See, you're stuck if your mindset's on lack. And you know how your mindset gets stuck on lack? When you're looking at the thing you've been believing for to meet your need and it wasn't God. I went to a convention in Ohio, I won't name the church, several years ago, and I was the last one there. I didn't know everybody was saying, well, you know, it's going to be a tough year and, you know, ministries are cutting back. Bless God and blah, blah. This and all that. Kind of, I didn't know any of that. You know, Caroline just flew in, you know, and they picked me up and I got there. And I tell you when, when I got there, it, the, it wasn't the favor of God. It was it was it, it was it was vogue, not fog. <laughs> Lord, gee, they was all oh, down. I said, what's wrong with y'all? I started preaching. By the end of that service, they were screaming. I said, it, I said, it, I said, all the other speakers talk about how bad it is. How come it ain't bad for me? You think God's a respected person? No. Then bless God. I said, if I'm blessed, you should be blessed. By the time it's all said and done, people are screaming and hollering. Two days later, the pastor called us back and said, Jesse, can you do the whole convention? I said, no, I can't do the whole convention. And they didn't do wrong. They just went by what they see. They got stuck. I like what Jerry's preaching. You know, uh, he used that Micah 7, when I fall, I shall arrive. Failure is not falling. Failure is living in the mud of life. Just get up. Just do something. Get up. You see, a mindset, a mindset stuck on lack can't produce any abundance of anything. So I believe in abundance. Now, the first thing people think of is money. Well, that's just one small facet of it. How about abundance of happiness? That's great. Now, I don't have to pray for abundance of joy because it's the fruit of the Spirit. So if you don't have any joy, uh, take a piece of my fruit. I got so much joy and so much happiness, it makes some people mad. Who do he think he is? They're just waiting for me to fall. Well, if I fall, I'll get up. But I ain't believing for that because I'm not even making that an option. Not every day that Satan's coming at me with something about something. You see what I'm saying? But I don't pay much attention to him. He's on the limits of retardation. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> he is not no longer a cherubim angel. The Bible said in the book of Ezekiel, if you want to see how big he is, he's about, about this big right now. He said, is this the thing? Th th this? This? Is what deceived the nations? This. I like to aggravate the devil. How you do that? <laughs> I live in one of the most sinful cities in America. It's called New Orleans. Some of y'all call it New Orleans. It's naturally New Orleans. 
It's called the big easy because any sin is easy to get. And I, and I, man, I'm known, but I sounded privately, I'm known all over that city. I can't walk anywhere, Lord. I have some ministers that come, they want me to take them to the French Quarter. I love the French Quarter, you know. But I say, they say, take us down Bourbon. No, 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 I ain't going to do that. But if you want to go, I'll let you go. Because I know I get on Bourbon Street, I'm going to be on Fox 8, Channel 4, and Channel 6. <laughs> he down on Bourbon Street where them strippers is. But you know, I got kind of tired of that. I said, you know, now if I go preaching, that's a different thing. So uh, we, uh, my, my favorite restaurant in New Orleans, Jerry, Carolyn really loves, especially Jerry, uh, uh, it's Mr. B's. He said, I can't come to New Orleans without my gumbo yaya. So we go down there, we're just enjoying ourselves. But there's sometimes I go down there and, and, and I can't park where I want to park, so I have to park over uh, by Saks Fifth Avenue to, and I'll walk. And there's, there's a strip bar as I pass by, you know, going toward Royal Street. Now it's not on Bourbon, this is just a side street. Now, this is how I aggravate the devil. So I just walk by. The like, devil doesn't know it's coming because, you know, you don't know. And all of a sudden, now you see a girl she, in the front. She's enticing. I just walk up like that and go, Jesus! And the devil go, ha! Oh! <laughs> and I just keep walking. <laughs> it just shake the devil. Oh, Lord, he's on the street. <laughs> it's so fun. To surprise the devil. <laughs> I was with John Hagee at the Omni Hotel, and not here, there, in New Orleans. <laughs> He's standing here checking him in. <laughs> and I love John. John and Diane are just wonderful people. <laughs> John said, he said, boy, he said, what are we going to eat? I said, well, you, what, what, we can get you anything, John. What do you want, man? I said, we, I, know, I know the best food. I know where to go. So this person comes in. Stand right, my John. <laughs> kind of a sweet devil. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> so I kind of backed about two steps away from the counter of the front desk and John's checking in. All of a sudden, sweet turned to sour. So John just turned around and looks like this. And this sweet devil says this. What are you doing here in my city? John goes, we got us a devil over on this side. <laughs> I went, <laughs> I said, I'll bind you in Jesus. Oh, Lord, I got to go. I just got to go. <laughs> Turned sweet and took off. Failure is not an option. I'll cast a devil out on the street. I don't care what people say. I cast the devil out on Delta Airlines one time. <laughs> you should have seen that, son. Can I say in clothes? I got to get Jerry this thing here. I'm walking past there. As I walk past there, this person go. I went. That's what I did, kids. I just. And normally I never sit in the back, but I, was, I had a back seat. The Lord said, did you see that devil? I said, I certainly did. He said, cast that devil out. I said, Jesus, I'm on Delta Airlines. <laughs> he said, I know where you are. I'm talking to you. I know where you are. <laughs> you mean you're going to let that devil stay in that person? I said, yeah, she's probably going to hell anyway. It doesn't make no difference. <laughs> I, don't, I, I said, God, I don't want to do that. I mean, we own that. We own We own We own the airline. They're going to come with the white coats and pick me up. I mean, this is before I had my own plane, you know. He said, oh, I could tell I was aggravating God. You mean to tell me you have power to deliver someone and you won't? I said, I'm on Delta L. That don't more bother God. That sounds like Peter. We fished all night. We caught nothing. We <laughs> he, 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 he just looking at you like. He said, I said, God, they will arrest me. He said, you don't have to touch him. Start rebuking the devil in your seat. I said, oh, okay, I can do that. Now, that person was about five seats ahead of me. So I guess I'll bind you, you demon devil from hell. I come against you in the name of Jesus. You know where I'm at. I'm back to Jesus. All of a sudden, I see this thing go. 
<laughs> now the person next to him goes. <laughs> person gets up like, excuse me. <laughs> this was so much fun. That's what I missed by having my own plane. Because I ain't letting no demon possessed person get on my plane. <laughs> I'm saying. I said, come on, jumps up, turn around, like, my God. The, there was kids, they went, oh, I mean, everybody freaking out, and I couldn't stand. I said, that person got a devil in him. People went, oh, devil, oh, devil. Or that devil coming at me, ah, oh, in the name of Jesus. I said, come out, boom, fell in the, in the aisle. <laughs> when God looked at me, he said, you killed her. I said, no. See, just free. The best part was a kid. He must have been six, seven, eight years old. He said, look at there, mama, an exorcism. <laughs> That's what he said. I'm not adding it. This is true. Boy, I mean, here come the, I said, don't touch her. She's had a devil in her. She's out. People go, okay, no. So I reached over there and I said, Father, just help this. Anyway, to make a long story short, she got her strength back. I said, she goes, thank you. I said, that's all right, sweetheart. Everybody just looking at me. I should have received an offering. I bet I'd have got a big offer. <laughs> I'd have paid cash for myself next right there, sir. Because I would have said this. Now, you know, this devil's looking around here to get somebody. <laughs> Dude, I get that money out your pocket with a devil. <laughs> well, it got to the captain. Captain come back and look. He went, sir. I said, that's it. Then I said, I'm going to jail, son. You know, because that captain, that's a federal, you, you don't say, that's a, you mess up on that plan. That's a federal offense. So I come up and I said, listen, it ain't my fault. I, I tried to let the person stay demon possessed, but the Lord wouldn't let me. He's just looking at me like, I said, I know that sounds crazy, but if you think I'm nuts, ask her. She free. He says, would y'all please close, told the flight attendants, they were called uh, uh, stewardesses that close, close the, <laughs> the curtain. There was a curtain. He says, so let me get this. This person had a devil. I said, yeah, they were demon possessed. And you cast it out. I said, yes, sir. He said, that's amazing. I said, yeah, it is. He said, you know, I, I wish I'd have seen. He said, you know, listen, I'm charismatic. I wish I'd have seen that myself. I said, you charismatic? He said, yeah, man, I, I've been wanting to see a devil cast out. He said, you think there's any more? <laughs> I wanted to say, no, they all went to American Airlines. <laughs> no, 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 just a joke. <laughs> just a joke, just a joke. But he was excited. I just knew I was going to jail. And I thought, I wonder how many Christian people would love to see the devil defeated by being cast out. Most people would be afraid. That man wasn't afraid. See, a mindset stuck on lack can't produce an abundance of anything. That's what I'm talking about. God's word. So failure is not an option. See, God didn't See, I was going to let that person stay possessed because of the environment I was in. You know, that, that's making failure an option. And it's wrong. So let me go over this again. Always aim for more than enough. Trust will give, always give rise to words and action. Proverbs 29, 25. The world needs people who believe. You must aim to be what God has made you, the head, not the tail, above and not beneath. A mindset stuck on lack can't produce an abundance of anything. Let me get to this other point. Daydreams are idle thoughts. They're a form of escape. Determined thoughts have purpose and direction. They are thoughts with intent. They take you places. 
I love this one here. Wandering around in daydreams never let you believe what it takes so you can change what it takes to start doing what it takes. And then finally, your destiny is not firm. Your free will has been given to you to make choices. Destiny happens one day at a time. So when you understand that this is what Elisha is trying to say to this girl. Now, I'm going to preach something different tomorrow night when I do the, um, uh, the night service. That's by, under the direction of the Lord. But let me just give you this. Here. When I come back Thursday, I'm going to deal on what do you have? He asked her. I'm going to deal with seed. A blessing always rests upon the seed of the righteous. Why? Seed has power. I'll say this. Seed creates ripples in the atmosphere. I call them spiritual tsunamis. I'm going to get into that really strong. Because see, all you need to have in life is a seed. They say man can create life. No, he can't. He has to take life to create life. We may be able to clone, but we've got to take life to produce life. God didn't have life. That's the difference. I'll say this. 99% of our DNA matches every gorilla and chimpanzee. So that's why they say we came from the ape family. No. You see, it's that 1% that makes the difference. That 1% that made the difference between us and an angel. That 1%. Because when's the last time you seen a gorilla become you? See, it's that 1%. See, the theological or the theoretical physicists think you got to have all that to produce this. So they say it's called evolution. It's not. See, it's that 1%. Notice this. One. Number one, let's make man. What's a man? That's what angel said. Never heard of that. They knew the wheel within the wheel. They saw seraphims, cherubims, archangels, military angels, all kinds. But what is a man? Do you know they're more excited about seeing you than you are seeing them? I know you don't believe that, but that's true. Because in the midst of everything, with this wonderful gift called free will, even though Satan may have attacked us, we say, Lord, we with you. That angels marvel at that. And the ones that fell, they say in the same thing Satan said 2,000 years ago, if we would have known, we'd have never crucified him. Ladies and gentlemen, your enemy is defeated, restricted, and rejected. All he's got to give you is failure and it's not an option. That's what I've been writing every month to all my partners. And I use different examples. Jonathan, boy, one of them, when, oh, when that lady said, yeah, even the dogs eat the crumbs. Oh. See, it don't make no difference what environment you're in. It don't make no difference. It makes no difference what the world's doing. That's why I'm not worried about North Korea. Because I prayed for President Trump and the cabinet. I prayed for the Congress. I pray for the local, state, and federal officials because God said, live a peaceful, gentle, quiet life if you do that. I was really proud of that senator, how he honored Brother Copeland and Sister Copeland last night. That blessed me. I took some guts to stand up. And why would anybody be mad in trying to save life? See, that's a mindset stuck. Stuck. See, can't even think intellectually, much less spiritually. Because you're destroying yourself. Did you enjoy it today? Yes. Give Jesus one hand clap. Come on. <laughs>